Hey folks, this is Emily. Today, I want to explore something a little different. I want to talk about science and energy. I think too much of the conversation about our human future focuses on what we're likely to lose and not enough about what we can save, what we could have. Focusing on points where you could make a stand, that's the kind of thinking you want if you like working the edges of a problem. And you all know there's few things that I enjoy more than that. So let's talk about a low energy future. It's obviously a certain amount of silliness for me to talk with you about a low energy future because I make my living doing video work. Energetically expensive, right? And while I can offset that energy use somewhat with my weird low consumption, always be gardening lifestyle, if we were to experience a significant tech collapsing event, I got scary news for you. Banks were around before computers and probably banks are still going to be coming after mortgage payments, even if their current systems crash out. I mean, financial institutions usually do pull themselves back together. It's happened before. So like many people who work online, this made me think, how am I going to support my family if all these systems go down? I want to tell you about my hilarious plan. Maybe you saw in my last video, we're doing some visioning work, organizational visioning work with AR, which has been really cool. And that process has inspired me to share some of my like real big pivot thinking thinking beyond anything resembling what my work with AR looks like today. Let's check out some books from my library. So these are a couple of my favorite volumes in my collection. And let me show you the inside. So these are a couple of volumes from 1890. And as you can see in this front piece here, they're a reprint and expansion of an 1885 publication. Don't worry, I have modern stuff too. I took this picture before I started filming because my basic medical microbiology textbook is the perfect thickness. It's a structural part of my set, part of my daily life. But back to the old stuff. Let's talk a little about what science was like back then, because I think this is a fun way to look at science and technology differently. A lot of us, when we think of being dropped 150 years in the past, maybe we got like some steampunk fantasies going on, right? Kind of a fantasy focus on technology rather than science. And a lot of our future visioning is also about technology rather than science. I hear from many people who, like me, work on screens. And by and large, let's admit, as a group, we're really stuck in the bargaining stage of grief. Where we're like, maybe I'm going to be able to be online for four hours a day. I'm still going to get the dopamine hit. Maybe I'll still be scrolling while I'm on the electric train. I'm going to be okay. I don't know, folks. I mean, like, Maybe. I like a nice cable car situation. We used to have a surprisingly robust electric train system growing in this country in the late 1800s. Cable cars and then electric streetcars were widely used for urban transportation well before 1900, before the budding automobile industry intentionally destroyed the systems we all wish we had today. But again, that's technology, and it's time to talk about something different. I don't hear a lot of people talking about biology and medicine and people's fantasies of the past or the future. I mostly hear a thread of true fear in people's voices as they wonder what will happen to them when they can't get their insulin and when that day might be. And people wonder how many people they love they are going to lose. The fear in the heart of a world where, once again, any untreated injury could cause a life-threatening bacterial infection, and there are no longer any antibiotics available. I want to talk with you and raise a serious possibility. We might very well be able to keep more medical science than you might think in a low-energy future, because there are really not quite technology, many of the things we would miss the most. At their core, they come from living things. They are biology. In these sweet color plates, I think they're so cool. You can see clear demonstrations of many of the techniques used in microbiology labs today. You can see that many of these plates are very familiar to the contemporary microbiology student. They're foundational. The core late 1800s microbiology techniques, the golden age techniques we call them, were not designed in a world with any disposable plastics. They were not designed in a world with any computers. They are techniques we could carry forward into a low energy future in many forms. Let's get practical. When we think about how insulin is produced today, it's a ton of plastic, right? The strain of bacteria that has been altered to produce insulin does not need to be maintained in plastic. 
The process of continuing to cultivate this strain and purify the insulin it produces could be done in glass. And I don't think you'd even need a minus 80C freezer, which is one of the key tools of modern microbiology and probably up there on the energetically expensive scale. You would need refrigeration, but low energy refrigeration is not an impossible problem. I got to spend many years playing in the lab. I was in the lab 20 to 60 hours a week from when I was 14 to when I was 24. I want to talk about my lifetime contribution to plastic waste. It's huge. But I learned a lot of things. I'm not prepared to make insulin today, but there is a feasible process, a low energy process. And if I needed to make a big pivot, whole different world pivot, I'm confident I could run the best little antibiotics workshop in the county. I think that penicillin, it's basic. You know, some people are dangerously allergic to penicillin. The drug does not treat all infections, but it's easy to get rolling. I'll tell you how to do the first steps in the end credits. All of the work to do that could be done in glass without modern high energy techniques. I like to keep some auger around because access to that material was a real game changer. One of the most exciting and untold East meets West stories in science. For most microbiology uses, auger is so much better than gelatin for stabilizing growth media. When we think about the history of science, the guts and bones of modern chemistry and microbiology, I think it's worth imagining deeply what can be accomplished, what we could carry with us. Look at science and medicine in 1925. Go back 100 years. At that point, we were already past the first human treatments with insulin. We had already begun using and producing antitoxins to save lives. This was like a miracle at the time that anyone should receive treatment that allowed them to survive lockjaw. The early antibiotics didn't require any more technology than was present 100 years ago. They just needed their moment to arrive. I would note vaccination as a breakthrough in that window from 1870 to 1920, but that would be an uneducated claim because the Chinese were doing extremely pre-modern inoculation against smallpox from the 1500s at least. If we could preserve glass production, stable heat sources, and basic refrigeration, we could do a lot. If you want to manipulate DNA, you really need like stable electric current to draw it out in a gel to sort it out by size. You couldn't do it with a salt gradient, but it would be really obnoxious. A lot of your pre-DNA techniques, they can be done with very low energy inputs and again, without plastic. There are a lot of super nerds here in the AR community. I'm sure there's someone out there listening who has the chemistry education needed to purify aspirin. I'm sure there's someone out there listening who is a glass blower or who knows one. Our dreams and imaginings about the future shouldn't be confined by high-tech visioning. I like to think about a world held in glass, a world made by hand. And as in so many of the possible paths forward, we have everything we need. Many small liberal arts colleges preserve foundational techniques and equipment. I went to Illinois Wesleyan University. I got just a great education there. My foundational science teachers, they were mostly old men. Some of them were old enough to have learned glass blowing as part of their practical education in the sciences. We are not so far removed from our past, and the chain is not broken. In the late 1800s, there emerged a new way of thinking, a fascination with the invisible life that is all around us, a way of thinking that had the audacity to imagine I could draw out a pure force from that mixed and mingled life. I could manipulate to my desire these unseen living forces that surround us. Like all forms of wizardry, to bring such a vision to fruition, it's all about technique and pulling together the right equipment. We've got what we need. I think a lot of the time when we imagine the future, culturally, it's either some high-tech Morlocks and Eloy situation, or maybe it's like homesteading, but we need to wear gas masks sometimes on account of the red smoke. It's like, bro, are we even imagining here? Really? Are we even looking at the real problem, which is an overshoot problem? If we want to imagine a future, really do the critical work that is play, we need to understand the frame. 
We need to figure out what the edges are and work the edges of the problem. Big frame is our planet's carrying capacity, and we're overshooting our planet's carrying capacity. The future we need is one where we drop energy consumption substantially and engage in deep regenerative work. Leaving the land alone is not enough. We need to be planting, assisting in landscape transformation, helping living things find new homes, learn which incoming species could make good community members and which should be guarded against. We will have less stuff. There will be less speed. In a future where we thread the needle, where we slow this freight train down fast enough that a lot of the parts remain salvageable when we hit the wall, what can we build from that place? In other times of civilizational collapse, the things people considered most generationally upsetting were the loss of skills. People forgot how to make dyes they really liked. They forgot how to make batteries, and then they spent centuries having fights about if they ever really could make batteries or not. I like to save seeds. I also like to save knowledge and skills and the means to pass them on. When I ask you to think about what you could save, I hope you hear me that this is also a question of what can we give? Our culture tells so many stories about things we cannot do. Stories that say, I'm not the right kind of person to do this or that. I need permission to do this thing I dream of. No one is telling me I'm the adult in the room, so I must not be. These stories are false. There's false stories. When I was a girl, I asked for a microscope for the holidays. I had a fascination with the unseen world from very early on. What happened was my brother got a microscope, which I was not allowed to use, and I was told that no one would marry me if I kept on the way I am. That there is a true story, and it's the kind of story many of us had experienced, a story which instills false beliefs about ourselves. We can let those go, my friends. We who would be ancestors, let us tell new stories which begin in new thinking. Thinking not, what will I lose? Thinking, what can I save? What can I pass on? What can I give to a community? I'm going to level with you too. As I've said many times before on this channel, I'm not a person who's going to survive without a community because I'm essentially rather delicate and fancy. But I've got good stuff to contribute, and I can do a lot of my best tricks in a society that supports a certain degree of complexity. When I imagine the future, I imagine there's a lot of work to be done. A world made by hand is a lot of work. And those who live in this future will do many kinds of work. Everyone will labor to their ability. Everyone will have a craft, a skill, a trade. Some of us today live on the edges of living cultures where people, regular everyday people, make music and art and sing. And I think that that is something that is critical to bring forward. Well, I freely agree this is getting pretty weird, which is a sign of good imagining. I have to say I could lose a lot myself and still be happy if I could do good work and fuss around in gardens and sing. I want a future where we got started thinking about these problems now in a different way. What we could have will we get out of overshoot. Everyone who is paying attention is seeing information quality deteriorate month by month. Many modern foraging, and I hear especially mushroom foraging books, have been created using AI tools. They contain sometimes false, sometimes dangerously false information. We have lived in the information age. We are entering the disinformation age. To look for the information we need, we would be wise to take a step back. To look backwards, look to older books. We will see a growing skepticism towards information of any kind as our society drinks from the fire hose of increasing misinformation of all kinds. I think that makes this an important time to identify high quality sources of information, to preserve, and to transmit. It is inarguably weird to spend time daydreaming about your mad scientist career pivot. But I don't know, folks, that's how things get done, is by dreaming about them. I'd love to see in the comments your vision about what we could have, what energy use you would like to prioritize in a low energy future. Everyone, I really hope we can come together on washing machines. Like, 
Fingers crossed. Community laundry. You don't have to believe to play. Play is important for mammals. It's seriously an acceptable behavior, even in mature humans. Thanks for spending some time with me doing something different. I'm doing my best to dream and to live in the reality that we are in a tipping point. There's a deep teaching I keep coming back to in my mind this week that life is a narrow bridge and the important thing is not to be afraid. I think always about how some people do freak out more hearing this teaching because what if the bridge is all there is? All the more reason, I think, to look around to make the most of the situation. Many of us here in the AR community, we have something special to give. I want to be ready to give, and I thank you for getting ready with me. I'll look forward to talking with you all again soon. All right, now it's the credits. Let's make antibiotics. AR community, this is the special way I'm going to say thank you on this end cap. First off, a big thank you to our donors, our volunteers, everyone spreading the word online, and everyone doing the work on the ground. Okay, let's go. Do you know what the mold that produces penicillin looks like? It's blue. It's fuzzy. It naturally colonizes bread in many climates, and it'll create a radius of growth inhibition on a plate. I.e., if you get it growing on like a petri dish, make a little plate of microbe food, this mold will push penicillin out into the plate as it grows. A kid licking snacks to lay a claim. There will be a ring around the mold where no bacteria grow. This blue mold has been recognized as medicinally powerful for a long, long time. People used to put blue moldy bread in a poultice and put it on wounds. Probably worked. But with a little science, we can do a step better than rubbing suspicious bread into our open wounds. Using basic plating techniques, it's pretty easy to separate the mold that produces penicillin and produce a pure culture. The mold is widespread. It's in, like, most indoor air. It grows at pretty normal temperatures, it likes to eat carbs, and it likes to kill bacteria. Put all that together, what it means is that this cutie is easy to grow and will kind of help you out with the isolation part of the job. So just imagine, instead of treating what is probably a painful infected injury with gross moldy bread, which may I remind you that old bread is often spiky and hard, with only a pinch of science, you could lay a pure culture on those wounds. Not only is this mold soft, fuzzy, and not interested in eating your flesh, using a pure culture instead of gross bread would totally minimize your chance of secondary wound infection. To purify the medicine so we can get a step beyond slapping mold on ourselves, we're going to need some more steps and more equipment. But I bet you can remember how to get this far. Watch a few videos on basic plating techniques for pure culture. That's the biggest skill you need. I've taught hundreds of people how to do those techniques. They're easy. They're fun.